Jack spent half of the six years that he was stationed in Hawaii in Bahrain. He was part of a crew that flew a fat gray plane, a P-3, throughout the northern Middle East and listened via radio to Russian movements there. Whenever he came home and his son Troy hugged him, he wished he could stick him forever in the belly of his flight suit. Then there he moved for three years to Monterey, California, where he taught Russian at the Defense Language Institute and stayed home year-round, and where one or two nights a week he and Troy went jogging. They set out from the base, which was atop the ridge that held that corner of the bay, and headed down to the beach to the tiny adobe downtown. They discussed the cars they wanted, or Troy went on about whatever team he was on, or they talked about whatever he was learning in school, or they talked about Tolkien, or they planned their next hawk watching trip, and Jack remembered the last one, when Troy had stood up through the sunroof and snapped pictures of peregrine falcons that he, Jack, had pointed out, and he, Jack, had looked up at him and been surrounded by strands of sunlight that floated like legs of jellyfish. Then they were moved to Brunswick, Maine, and Jack began going overseas again. On his first night home after his first time out, as he and Troy jogged a quarter mile out of base, Troy said nothing. Outside the gate, they turned left onto a strip of icy grass, which ran between a barbed wire fence and a road. When Jack asked if school was going well, Troy said, yeah. When he asked if he had made any friends yet, Troy said, yeah. What were their names, he said. They were just guys from basketball, Troy said. Cool, Jack said. Then he asked if they were going to make the playoffs, and Troy said he didn't know. And Jack saw two cold streetlights out in the aqueous dark. You seem a little quiet, he said. Troy said he was just tired. You sure, Jack said? Yeah, Troy said. When they came into the cheddar-colored light, Jack moved his hand as though he was moving a chess pawn, but Troy said he had homework. Jack watched him go upstairs, and then he joined his wife, who was standing smoking out on the screened-in porch by the orange sliding glass door, her face etched out of the darkness. Her smoking sweatshirt was one of his old sweatshirts, and after sliding the door shut, he pulled on another one of his sweatshirts from the back of the chair. You didn't tell me you got quiet. What do you mean? I mean, he's all sulky. Was he like that with you when I was gone? What are you talking about? I mean, he's all sulky. He's always had a moody streak. Well, I haven't noticed it. Well, you haven't paid attention then. He tried to recall the moodiness. Don't worry about it, she said. It's probably just a phase, if anything. You have to remember, she said. He's getting used to a new place. Plus, he's a kid. Don't you remember any phases like this? No, he said. I was happy as a clam. You're a freak then, she said. A year passed, Jack went out twice. Now, if Troy wasn't studying or at practice, he was with his friends, with whom, on weekends, he often went to Portland, which was half an hour away, or Boston, which was three. Whenever he returned from either, Jack would be sitting on the couch, watching TV or reading. Troy would head straight for the stairs, but Jack, from where he sat, would put his hand out for a low five, right in his way. And Troy would limply slap it, and Jack would seize his hand and hold it. So how was Beantown, he'd say. Fine, Troy'd say. Fine, Troy would say. What'd you do, he would say. Just walked around, Troy would say. Cooley would say, and then he would nod as though to a beat. Troy might say, we went to the Museum of Fine Arts. Oh yeah, Jack would say? What do they have there? Any Van Gogh? And he would pronounce it Gogh on purpose, and Troy would smile and give a quick laugh through the nose. Yeah, he would say, I think they had some of him. Oh yeah, Jack would say? Yeah, Troy would say. Who else, Jack would say? I can't remember, Troy would say. We were only there for an hour. Oh yeah, Jack would say? Where else did you go? I don't know, Troy would say, all over. Oh yeah, Jack would say? Yeah, Troy would say. And then he would yawn and say that he was going to bed, and then he would say goodnight to both of his parents simultaneously, and then he would try to move off, but Jack would have his hand. Hey, Jack would say, I'll see you in the morning. I know, Troy would say. Jack, leave him alone, Laura would say. She would be sitting with her ankles crossed on his thighs, and she wouldn't look away from her book or from the TV. And Jack would say goodnight, and again that he would see Troy in the morning, and Troy would say goodnight. Jack was from Orono, which was a town in the northern inland part of Maine. Since he had joined the Navy, he had hoped that if he was ever sent somewhere, he'd have to leave a lot, so pretty much anywhere but Monterey. It would be Brunswick. He had known that there was a good chance because there was only a handful of spots in the nation for Russian CTs, or cryptological technicians. When he was moved to Brunswick, which was on the coast, his father lived three hours up the coast in a small town past Bar Harbor, and his brother lived in Portland. A few summers after the move, his father died of an aneurysm. Jack left voicemails for his brother. He sent emails. He called his brother's work, but they said he had just gone on vacation and couldn't say where. Twice he drove down from his father's, knocked on the door, and waited around for half an hour. On the morning of the funeral, with darkness coming in over the plane of his headlights, he drove down again and threw his body into the door, but the place was dark and empty. Thank you.